All right, well, I need to see if y'all can think, uh, think like I do for a moment. Uh, and that might be a scary thought for some of you. But let me consider. I'm going to think of, I'm going to say something, things that, there are some things that are meant to go together, right? Some things that they're, it's by design, it's like they always should have been there. So see if you think like I do and see if you come up with the same thing. So if I say peanut butter, what goes with that? Peanut butter and jelly, okay. Now, I have to get this one out of the way first. If I say chocolate, what, what would you say would be, goes with chocolate? You see, there's just about everything you can answer is goes with chocolate. So chocolate's kind of the given answer for everything, uh, for most of them anyway. So you have peanut butter goes with jelly, salt and pepper, uh, Oreos and milk. See, y'all think like I do here. Ketchup and see you. You did the French fries one yesterday. Some I, I thought of ketchup and mustard. Sweet and sweet and sour. Macaroni and okay. Cake and ice cream. Stars and stars and stripes. So we got some patriotic people here. That's good. Uh, and then, uh, like I said, chocolate goes with just about everything. You could say peanut butter. Uh, you know, they make a candy off of that one. And uh, caramel, and chocolate, and milk. All, the, all But on the flip side, here's the flip side of this. There are some things that are not meant to go together, right? There are some things that are not meant to go together and things that do not mix well. So if I talk about oil, doesn't mix with water, okay? Some of these are a little bit uh, more challenging. You talk about bull. A bull doesn't go in a in a china shop. So you got that one. Uh, the one that causes the the biggest trouble was if I say hair dryers. What doesn't go with a hair dryer? Like a bathtub or water. You know, y'all ever seen the pictures of people trying to dry their hair and they're still in the water sometimes and still wet? Not a good thing. Uh, then then this one was a little challenging. Aluminum foil doesn't go with. Yeah, some of y'all got it. Microwaves. What happens when you put aluminum in microwaves? It kind of sparks up. It doesn't look, go very good. Even scripture kind of makes this kind of point because there are some things that aren't supposed to go together, especially out of the same mouth. Uh, and blessings are not supposed to be mixed with curses, right? And you think about the holy. What is not supposed to be mixed with the holy? What's that? Unholy, okay, the, un, uh, the profane, right? The holy and the profane don't mix together. The holy and the, the pagan things don't mix together. So there are things that go together. There are things that are not supposed to go together. And they're not supposed to mix in any way. And we're, as we've been reading through, you know, keeping up with the, the portions that you have down in the, the readings that's in your bulletins from last week, this is... I tell you all that uh, the readings from that are in last week's bulletin will be in this week's message. So the ones that you see today will be where the message is drawn from next week. So we're looking at Exodus chapter 32 today. We get to see an example of that principle of things. Some things are not supposed to mix. And you see that example of that today where Moses and the Israelites are at the base of Mount Sinai. And they are camped around, they're waiting. Moses is up on the mountain. You know, he's already spoken. They've already heard the Ten Commandments. But now they're waiting on Moses. So Exodus chapter 32 starts out this. This is the chapter, it goes along with the cartoon that's in there as well, about the golden calf. Y'all know that one? It says, when the people saw that Moses was delayed in coming down from the mountain. So he has been up there for how many days? He's been up there for 40 days. So he's delayed in coming down from the mountain. They gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before us, because this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. So he's gone up on there on the mountain, and he's not coming back. And this is not just a casual, friendly conversation. This is likely a mob of people that are afraid, that don't know what
what's happening. They're, they're, I mean, they're, you're talking about, with the Israelites camped there at the base of the mountain, you're talking about several million people. And they've been waiting around for over a month for Moses to come back down from the mountain. That means they're trying to figure out, well, where do we get our food? Where do we get our water? When are we leaving? So things will crash. After several million people, do you think the crash will be piling up a little bit? Yeah. Okay, so they're waiting on all this stuff, and they're really getting concerned about where Moses is. We don't know what has happened to him. We don't know if he's coming back. It goes on, it says, Then Aaron replied to them, Look, take off the, the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Bring me your jewels. It says, so all the people took off the gold rings that were on their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he took the gold from their hands. He fashioned it with an engraving tool, so he worked on it. And he made it into an image of a cow. And then they said, Israel, this is your God. This is the one who brought you up from the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. Then he made an announcement. There will be a festival, a feast to the Lord tomorrow. And early the next morning they arose. They offered their burnt offerings. They presented their fellowship offerings. The people sat down to eat and drink, and then they got up to play. Now some of them, the translate will say they got up to act in revelry. So where is Moses? He's gone. He's been up there for about a month before all of this stuff, stuff starts. And when you're reading the book of Exodus, what happens between chapter 25 and here in chapter 32, everything that you read from chapter 25 to 32, that's Moses up on the mountain. That's the conversation that Moses and God are having. So while they're up there talking to each other, while he's laying out, we talked about the, the tabernacle a couple of weeks ago. We talked about the, the high priest and his robes and things like that. While he's having that conversation with God, the people down, down at the base of the mountain are like, man, I don't know if he's coming back. What do we do now? See, when Moses is up on the mountain, he is getting the how of how do we worship God? How do we approach him? How do we come to him? That's what the tabernacle was about. That's what the, the, the altar was all about. The incense was about. The, 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 the lampstand, the showbread, the Ark of the Covenant, all that stuff. They're learning, or Moses is learning, how, how do we approach and worship God in the way that he wants to be worshipped. Y'all realize, y'all believe that God has a certain way that he wants to be worshipped and ways that he doesn't want to be worshipped? You ever think about that? Think about it like this. How many of y'all have ever had a, a nickname? Anybody ever call you a nickname? You ever have a nickname that you didn't like? Okay, I see a few hands. Have you ever, have you ever got to the point where you finally told people, you know what, I really wish you would stop calling me that? Okay. What do you think about the people that even after you ask them to stop calling you that, you let them know and they still want to call you that name? Does it bug you? Does it get on your nerves? And even maybe they were doing it before they didn't know that it bothered you. Maybe you told them that it bothered you and they still do it. That says something. See, there is a certain way that God desires to be approached and he desires to be worshipped. But, you know, the longer that he is gone, the greater there is this pressure down at the bottom from those millions of people to do something rather than nothing. Because the one that they wanted to speak to God on their behalf, the mediator between them and God, and God is gone, and they were not hearing from God. They were not hearing from Moses. They essentially had no vision. They had no revelation of what they were supposed to be doing. They knew who they were supposed to be worshiping, but they also didn't know the how. And when there's no vision, and there's no revelation, what happens? What does Proverbs say where there is no vision? The people perish. Right? Yeah, some of your other translations may put it, 
a way that's very fitting for this passage. Because remember, once they got up in the morning, they offered their feasts and festivals, and they got up to do what? They got up to pray. They got up to act in reverence or whatever else. Well, in some of your other translations of Proverbs 29, 18, will say, where there is no revelation, where there is no vision, the people run wild. Or some of them will say the people pass off that sound like what's happening here? Here in Exodus 32? They're not getting the word from God because Moses has been gone. This is what's happening. They're casting off restraint. The pressure is mounting to do something. Because right now they don't understand God. They don't understand his will. They don't understand his purposes. And they're unwilling to wait patiently for him. They knew the who to worship, but they didn't know the how to worship. And the problem is, is when we don't know what we're doing, when God doesn't tell us, when we're not listening to him, that means we're going to try to figure out how to approach God on our own. And we're going to try to do it on our own terms. We're gonna, and we've been trying to figure that out, to do it our own way, ever since Cain and Abel. But the problem is also found in Proverbs. There's a way that seems right to a man, but It might make sense for you and me to do things a certain way. It might make, well, you know, I think I like doing it that way better. But if it's our way and not God's way, it leads to death. And we need to understand that because here Moses is gone. The one that they're looking for, uh, the one that they wait for, for communication, is not there to talk to them. And so now they're starting to come toward God, the one who brought them up out of Egypt, but they're coming to him the wrong way. And also keep in mind that you know, when the Israelites left and came out of Egypt, did they come? Was it just the Israelites that came out? It was, it was a multitude of people. It was a whole bunch of different people, including a lot of the Egyptians came out with them. So here they had just gone through and experienced all of those plagues. They had just seen all of their deities, all of their gods be totally defeated, knocked out by the God of the Israelites. And they came with them. And those Egyptians still, it's only been 50, 40 days maybe since they left. Do you think they've left everything about what they believed behind yet? Do you think they've learned everything about what this new... God is that their following is supposed to be about? I even wonder sometimes, and this is speculation on my part, I wonder how many of the priests of Egypt, after they just saw their, their God get whipped, I wonder how many of the priests went out with them. Say, well, you know what? Our guy just got stomped. I think we need to go with the one who won that fight. So I just kind of wonder about that. And so they have certain ways and things that they think works when they talk about reaching and connecting with God because while Moses again he's up on the mountain he's getting all of that conversation about the tabernacle about the altar about the priests and the, the clothing and all that stuff but the people down at the bottom of the mountain have they heard that yet do they know that yet no because Moses hasn't come down yet and you know what's even amazing is before Moses went up on that mountain not even Moses really knew Back in Exodus chapter 10, this is when he's trying to get Pharaoh to look, look, let us go. And we've got to all go out with us because this is what he says. He says, you must also let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings to prepare for Yahweh our God. And even our livestock might, must go with us. So it, it can't be just the men. It can't be just the, we can't leave our women and children. We can't just, the, we can't leave our livestock behind. We've all got to go. And this is the reason why. He says, not a foot will be left behind because we will take some of them to worship Yahweh our God. We will not know what we will use to worship Yahweh until we get there. So not even Moses really knows. He knows who he's going to worship, but he doesn't necessarily know how. That's something he's got to learn. That's something that the people have to learn. That's something that God has to show us. We won't know 
how to do it until we get there. And so now, without Moses, they're beginning to mix worship of the true God with all the things that they knew before. They're starting to mix the worship of the true God with the paganism of Egypt and the nations around them because later they're told not to do this. Later they are told not to worship their God like the nations around them. And we cannot mix God with anything else. Our worship with God is not supposed to be like that. Can you all tell what that is? Uh, it's, it's a cake bowl. It's a mixing bowl with uh, the cake batter and all that stuff all mixed and mashed in together. We cannot worship God in a way that reminds us of anything like that. And it includes even things that our culture will accept and think is normal. We cannot mix with God. We have to be willing to examine our own lives. We have to be willing to examine our own practices, even in, in this church, for how we have mixed the pagan with our worship of God. I mean, how many, we've sung the song before, there's that song, Jesus, name above all names. Y'all remember that song? Would we ever, or would you ever want the song, Allah, name above all names, to be sung in this church? You know, there's a lot of people in a lot of places that would be fine with that. Because they don't see a difference between Allah and Jesus. Is there a difference? Yep. That might not offend some of us, but do you think that would offend God? Yep. And see, it's his opinion that we need to worry about. See, we have to even examine what our culture accepts and expects. To where we don't mix the worship of the true God with things that are not true. You know, do, you know, where in the Bible, you know, we talk about the resurrection that's coming up. Where in the Bible does it talk about bunnies and eggs in connected to the resurrection? It doesn't. But we have accepted that. Not because the Bible tells us to do that, but because we're mixing and we don't even realize it. We don't even make the connections even anymore because we have no obligation to that kind of stuff. It's not in the scripture. So where does it come from? See, the reading, this is something with reading from the, the prophets that we saw last week was out of 1 Kings. And it's the account of Elijah on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal. Y'all remember that story? That was a people who thought they could play both sides of the fence. They thought that was a people who thought they could mix Worshipping Baal with worshiping Yahweh, the God who brought them up out of Egypt. And to that, Elijah says this. This is 1 Kings 18. I am missing a passage. It says, Elijah approached the people and he said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If Yahweh is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. How long are you going to waver between these two positions, these two uh, expectations, or these two outcomes? How long are you going to try to mix them together? If Yahweh is God, then follow him and follow him only. If Baal is God, follow him, follow him only. It says the people in that passage, they did not answer a word. They didn't respond. They didn't give him uh, an answer to what he said. They didn't answer because they thought one was just as good as the other. They didn't see the problem. They thought they were the same. They could mix and match. They didn't think they had to decide between them. They thought they could know. And the thing is, they really couldn't tell the difference. They couldn't decide between them. They could no longer recognize the difference between the holy and the profane, things that don't go together. They couldn't tell. And oftentimes, neither can we. Neither can our culture and neither can many of our children. Is that not a problem in our country? We can't recognize the difference between what is right and wrong. You know, it's said that if you stand, if you don't stand for anything, then you will fall for everything. 
you don't stand for anything, you will fall for everything. We can't tell, and we have political leaders, politicians, who won't call things evil anymore, even when it's right in front of their face. And what's good is oftentimes now called bad. And what is bad is often now times promoted and called good. How many of y'all have seen that sticker before on the back of people's cars? What's it mean? It just means that we, we say we're all the same. We can all just get along. There's no real difference between me. That's the message that our culture is sending. So I, I kind of like this one a little bit better. It's using a lot of those same symbols that says contradict instead. Because they can't all be true. They're all saying so many different things. They can't all be saying the truth. See, we, in many ways, with our culture, with our issues, we are trying to rewrite the holiness of God by our own standards Because we're no longer really hearing from him. Our nation is much like the nation of Israel at the bottom of Mount Sinai. They're not hearing from God, so they're just winging it. And trying to make stuff up as we go. We're no longer listening to him. We're no longer listening for him. We no longer recognize the voice of our shepherd. Because we no longer seriously consider what his word actually says. Because the issue is, we don't recognize the difference between the holy and the profane anymore. Our children cannot discern good and evil anymore. We don't even, because we don't even realize how we have mixed it up with our own practices and called it even church. We don't recognize where we have done that. There's a things that may seem right to us, but the end of it is actually death. See, we talk about holiness, but whose standard of holiness are we going to deal with? Is it going to be my standard? Or is it going to be your standard? I mean, who gets to decide and set what the standard is? That's how relativism talks. That, hey, your opinion is just as good as mine. So what we need is an opinion that is neither yours nor mine but it's the one who has the authority to set what the standard is. Because how about God's standard for holiness? I mean, wouldn't that be better? And guess where you find God's standard of holiness? It's right in here. In fact, if you look in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, that's the the Torah, the first five books. Almost everything about holiness is going to be in there. And all of the rest of the scripture, from the, the Psalms, the prophets, uh, you know, they're all oftentimes commentary on, a, a, on the Torah, about the Torah, or almost every prophet, including Jesus, is trying to refer people back to the word. He's trying to call them back to what the scriptures actually says, and not our attempt at mixing or approaching God with, on our own terms. That's so many of the conversations that Jesus has with the Pharisees and scribes. Look, you're trying to do it this way, but God's word says do it this way. You have heard that it was said, but I say to you. Or he, there's those other instances where he goes, like in Mark chapter 7, verse 8, where he's having this discussion with them about you know, the washing of the hands, or, and then he turns it into the discussion about caring about mom and dad and honoring mother and fa- father and mother. He says, look, you guys are making a big deal about something that's just one of your traditions. It's not even in the word. Whereas when the word says something, you try to throw it out. He says, disregarding the command of God, you keep the traditions of men. He also said to them, you completely invalidate God's command in order to maintain your tradition. You're doing something that seems right to you, and by in doing so, you're disregarding, invalidating what the word actually says. And he's like, guys, you're in the wrong spot if you're pulling that stuff. You're doing the wrong kind of thing. 
Verse 13 in that same passage says, you revoke God's word by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many other similar things. See, we are still doing this in our culture, in our churches. We find ways to invalidate God's word for our own comfort. We find excuses to not do what it says because we think we know better. That's actually kind of what that cartoon is about. You know, he says, if you look close, Moses, you'll see that it's not a calf at all, but it's really, rather, it's a full-grown yak. And it's not for worshiping, it's really just for show. Can we, can we excuse ourselves if it's something that we want to do? Can we find reasons to keep doing it even when somebody says not to? Man, I've been good at that since I was three years old. Anybody else? Yeah, I see a couple of hands. Some of y'all just aren't admitting it. But see, Elijah rejected all of that. Elijah rejected it. Look at 1 Kings 18. This is after, you know, they, he set up this, this contest to see who is the real and true God. You build an altar, and they had 450 plus guys on one side, and it was just him on the other. He's like, look, the God who answers by fire, he's the real true God. And he's like, I'm going to do you a favor. I'm going to let you go first. And so all of them were doing this from morning until the afternoon. It says, they shouted loudly and cut themselves with knives and spears according to their custom until the blood gushed over. And if you read that passage at length, you'll see that at different points, Elijah starts making fun of them. He starts taunting them. Like, maybe you're not loud enough. Maybe your God's asleep and you need to wake him up. And he, he's hard. But he doesn't want there to be any doubt about who wins this, con this contest. And so they get crazier and crazier. More and more, they're casting off restraint. Blood was gushing over them, and he says, All afternoon they kept on raving until the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no sound, no one answered. In other words, the, no, this God that they are claiming is not doing anything in response, and now all the Israelites that were watching, they're not even paying attention anymore. And see, what's, what's amazing is in this description of this pagan worship, I strongly suspect that everything that the prophets of Baal were doing, the shouting, the dancing, the cutting themselves, I strongly suspect that's exactly what the Israelites were doing at the base of Mount Sinai. That they were doing all the same kind of things because that's what the nations around them did. That's what the people in Egypt did. That was normal. That was how you approached God. And God wants nothing to do with any of that stuff. He will never will ask any of that kind of stuff of us. And Elijah rejected that. Of course, how does that story end? There is no response. And so when Elijah steps up, he doesn't even try to make it easy. You know, remember? He builds up his altar, puts the, the, the meat from the, the bull on it, and then what does he do? He, take, he says, you know, get some of these big 10-gallon drums, and we're going to dump some water on it. He digs a trough around it. He puts the wood on there, puts the meat on top of that, and then dumps about 30 gallons of water on top of all of it, where it even fills the dip. He's like, this is, I'm not going to make this easy. And he just stood up. it all. The, the meat, the wood, the stones, the water, it was gone. Because he was answering by fire. See, this is, these are the things that God wants to take us out of, to remove us from. He does not want mixing the, the pagan with 
the holiness of God. He does not want that for the people of God. And so we go back to Exodus 32. It says, the Lord spoke to Moses. Remember, Moses is up there on the mountain. And as they don't know what's going on with Moses, he doesn't necessarily know what's going on with them. They're, they know who to worship. They don't know how. Moses is up there learning the how. And the Lord spoke to Moses. He says, go down at once. So is God, he's talking to Moses, but is he paying attention? Does he see what's going on down there? Yeah. Does that mean that he sees what goes on in our lives, in our country, in our nation? Yep. He still sees it. He says, go down at once for your people you brought out, you brought up from the land of Egypt have acted corruptly. All of a sudden he's calling them, this is your people, man. You're leading these guys. They have acted corruptly. Corruptly. And this idea of corruption, he says, it carries with it the idea of decay or destruction. Again, the ways that make sense to us lead to death. And it's a word that is used repeatedly in the book of Genesis, but it's used in specific places. This idea of corruption is used in the days leading up to the flood. So in the days of Noah, it talks about corruption. The other place it's used in Genesis is leading up to Sodom and Gomorrah. And how does God respond to those incidents of this extreme corruption? Does he bring his judgment down on them? Yeah. Yeah, he does. Okay? So that's what he sees. They are acting corruptly. They are acting just like they acted before the flood. They are acting just like they were acting before Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says in verse 8, he says, They have quickly turned from the way that I commanded them. They've, they've found excuses and reasons not to. You know, he had given them ten commandments, and they, that should have been enough to last for 40 days. You would think. But they have quickly turned from the way. How quick does our heart is willing to turn and start mixing things that make us comfortable but that offend God? He goes on, he says, they have made for themselves an image of a calf. They have bowed down to it, sacrificed to it, and said, Israel, this is your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Notice, they, they're still calling this bull, this idol that they've made, they're still calling it God. They're not calling it some other God. They're calling it, this is the one who brought us up. So they have the identity sort of right. They're just doing it wrong. He says, the Lord also said to Moses, I have seen this people, and they are indeed a stiff-necked people. Boy, I don't want to be one of those, do you? Sometimes we are. He says, now leave me alone. In other words, go back down the mountain so that I, my anger can burn against them, and I can destroy them he says then I will make you Moses into a great nation so look I'll, I'll wipe them out and start over with you so even though the, the people of Israel they, they thought that they were they even thought in some strange way they thought that they were not violating the commandment because they were saying, well, look, we're not making an idol to another god. We're making an idol to him. It's just the same god, one god. We're not worshiping somebody else. They were still trying to figure out and justify, this is how we're not doing that. They thought they were not violating the commandment, but God thought that they were. So whose opinion really matters? It's God's opinion that matters. If you ask us, we'll let ourselves off the hook. But God says, no, that's not what's going on. They were mixing the profane with the holy. So maybe they were trying to justify it. Maybe they were doing all of those other types of things. Aaron even thought he was leading them in a festival to the one true God. So even though they thought they were doing good, even though they thought they were trying to do right by the best of their knowledge and ability, they were still mixing. And God was rejecting their attempts at worship 
even the bowing down, sacrificing, because they were doing it in the wrong way. I mean, I even heard, I had the radio playing this morning, a worship song. Again, we, you know, we wouldn't want certain songs played in here that mixes it. But I heard a, a popular worship song that encourages and teaches pantheism, that God is the whole universe, that God is everything. And it was terrible theology in what is otherwise is a good song. But it mixes just enough in there to say, I don't ever want that song to be sung or played in here. One line. See, we mix when we say that he approves of things that he doesn't really approve of. We mix when we say that he is for things that he is not. We mix when we say that he is just like all the other gods in the world, saying that he doesn't care how we worship him, that he doesn't care how we approach him, saying he doesn't even care if we mix the holy and the profane together. See, that's what our world wants God to be like. It wants God to not really care. We want God, a God that fits the coexist model. Because that requires really no change on our part. There's no demands, no expectations, no, no standards. And so I can do whatever she or he wants to do. That makes the world comfortable. But out of that, God calls us from that and says, that's not the way it's going to be. Not if you claim my name. It says he calls them a stiff-necked people. You know, so it may not be a big deal to us, but it is a big deal to him. And it his, says his, his anger burns hot. You know, they're seeing his fire on the mountain, and he, he, he will destroy that corruption. But here's the thing. Remember I mentioned in Isaiah 46, he tells the end from the beginning. You get to see the gospel even here in this moment. Because what comes next? is intercession. What we need most of all. Because it says, Moses interceded with the Lord his God. Lord, why does your anger burn against your people? See, on our own, we give God many reasons to judge us. Do we not? I mean, the wages of our sin is death. That's what should be expected. And we cannot stand against the wrath of God being poured out against us. But, so what we need is someone to intercede on our behalf. To stand in the gap. And see, Moses is willing to do that for the Israelites. And that is despite the fact. Moses is willing to stand up there on their behalf despite the fact uh, of the way that he has been treated by those same people. Those same people have griped at him, complained at him, blamed him for everything going on. Hey, you know, you came into Egypt, and the first thing that happened is our workload was doubled. You, what are you doing, Moses? You're bringing us out of here, out uh, into the desert, and you're planning on killing us out here? What's your problem? They griped and complained at everything he did and everything he said. And yet he was still willing to intercede on their behalf. See, Moses is a foreshadowing. He is a type of the Messiah, of the one that is to come. He is interceding on behalf of his people, you know, standing in the gap between them and the wrath of God. And he is interceding for a people who don't even recognize. He's interceding on behalf of a people who do not appreciate him, who ultimately reject him and crucified him. And yet he was still willing to intercede on their behalf. And see what's and what he points out to him, what Moses is talking to him about. He says, Moses or God, this is this is your reputation that you're for. He says, You brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a strong hand. This is the people, your people. Why would your anger burn against your people that you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a strong hand? 
Why should the Egyptians say he brought them out with an evil intent to kill them in the mountains and wipe them off the face of the earth? See, God's character, they're going to say that you did this on purpose. They're going to say that you had an evil intent. And that's not God's intent at all, is it? He also knows and also states that his word was at stake. Whether or not God was somebody who has fulfilled his promises. So his character is at stake, whether he is evil or good. And his word is at stake with whether or not he's do, you're going to do what he says you're going to do. So go to the next verse. He says, turn from your great anger and relent concerning this disaster planned for your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. You swore to them by your very self and declared, I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and will give your offspring all of this land that I have promised and they will inherit it forever. He swore to do it. So if God wipes them out and destroys that people, what would that make him? If he doesn't do what he says he's going to do, we call somebody like that a liar. And is God a liar? Not in any way, shape, or form. That would make his name be profaned. And God will never do anything to allow to, for his name to be profaned. He will never mix or compromise his character is, and, or his holiness. He will never do anything to compromise his character or his holiness. He'll never mix it with anything. So why should we? Why should we be willing to do that? He goes on in verse 14, he says, So the Lord relented concerning the disaster he said he would bring on his people. Then Moses turned and went down the mountain. This is where it gets interesting. Because Moses is up on the mountain, he doesn't know what's going on down there. He says, with the, he's going down with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands. So he's carrying those, those uh, inscribed stone blocks. He said they were inscribed on both sides, inscribed front and back. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablets. So he's going down the mountain. He says, when Joshua heard the sound of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a sound of war at the camp. So this is, this is getting pretty boisterous down there. But Moses replied, it is not the sound of a victory cry, not the sound of a cry of defeat. I hear the sound of singing, of attempts at worship. Verse 19 says, As he approached the camp and he saw, this is Moses, seeing the calf and the dancing, Moses became enraged. And it's using the same words that it used of God just a couple of verses before. And he threw the tablets out of his hand, smashing them at the base of the mountain. Moses is coming down, and he saw the mixing of the worship. He saw the mixing of the holy and the profane. And it offended him. Moses was offended because of what he saw. And you've got to be thinking... If it offends God, it should offend the people of God. And on top of all that, Moses is standing there seeing all this stuff, and he's looking around going, man, I just spoke up for you people. I just vouched for you. To say that, thinking that it can't be as bad as what you're saying. And he's going down there, and he's seeing it for himself. And you know, there are, when we mix the holy and the profane, it should offend, it does, it, we know it offends God, it should offend us. We should not allow those kinds of things to happen. And there are consequences of mixing the holy and the profane. How many of y'all, when you were growing up, ever had to deal with castor oil when you got in trouble? I see a few hands. How many of you have ever got your, your mouth washed out with soap? I see a few more hands. Okay. If y'all think that's bad, 
What do you think what Moses does here? So then he took the calf. Remember, this golden calf that they made from all this jewelry they had made. He burned it up, and he ground it into a powder. He scattered the powder over the water and made the Israelites drink it. How many of y'all prefer that or prefer the castor oil to that? I think I would. I think I would. See, there are consequences of mixing the holy and the profane. And there are consequences when we try to come to God on our own terms, in our own way, without really seeking what he wants and what his opinion is, and that we're coming on not on his terms. When we try to mix things together that don't belong. Because they may not offend us. But we need to ask whether or not they offend him. Those of us who call ourselves believers, we have to ask. We have to be willing to examine our lives to see how we are mixing our, our life with things that don't belong and for those who still don't know, who still have never made a decision to follow Jesus as Messiah, as their Savior, if this is something new to you, then you need to know that we, you must come to God on his terms, not yours. It's not because you're not a good person. It's not because you've gone to church. Those aren't the terms that we come to him because you can come here all your life. And you're still not on his terms. We come to him on his terms. And that is, you know, God's holiness must deal with sin. That's the bottom line. And either you stand in your sin by yourself or you have an intercessor who stands there on your behalf. You have someone who stands there with you. See, Everything about that is the work of Jesus. Everything about that is the work of the Messiah in his son who paid the debt of sin for you. His wrath was poured out on him, on the cross, that you might stand before God and live. Because he lives, we can face Tomorrow, he is the one who paid the debt for our sins. So his holiness, his righteousness, his character, his word will not be compromised. But that's also his heart and his love that says, I'll take that on. I will bear that burden. I will bear that cross on your behalf. And the gospel asks that question, will you accept it? Will you accept the gift that I am giving to you? And if you accept it, you will live. That is the promise. Father, I just come before you. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, who has truly gone before us, who truly intercedes on our behalf, And I just pray, Lord God, for your, your con continued mercy. Lord, show the things in our lives, in our church, where we mit try to mix with the world, with things that are not biblical, things that don't belong. And Lord, let us not be stiff-necked to where we will be unresponsive to you. Help us, Lord, to see. Help us, Lord, to live in your glory, in your love. May we be a people that does not mix, but stands with you. We love you, Lord. We trust you. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen.